I was the first one to point the whistle, blow the whistle, point the finger at Nestle, then called Perrier. And, uh, but, it was, but it was about you folks here, and it was about the struggle to keep them from ruining the McCann River. And uh, it was so marvelous to be here and to see a community really take charge and quite literally chase them out of the state. Nestle, of course, deserves special criticism because they think that we Americans will find greater cachet in spring water, and therefore they want to pump water from next to these critical springs to provide cold, clear water to trout streams like the McCann. But, but what is really amazing about that story, I think, is that something as seemingly innocent as water for human consumption, an incredibly important use, every physician says we don't drink enough, could have these environmental consequences. So that, that book, Water Follies, was, was to bring the story nationwide. Those of you who visited Tucson know there used to be a river called the Santa Cruz. It's now no longer a river. First thing I'd like to suggest is real simple and real scary. We have a water crisis in the United States. It's not the future. It's right here, right now. 36 states uh, are or will suffer water shortages within the next 10 years under normal flow conditions. Not under conditions of drought, under normal flows, normal precipitations, 36 states are suffering shortages. The examples of this are quite dramatic. In the last year, four different states have refused permits for power plants because there was not enough water to run them. There's a factory in South Carolina that shut because it didn't have enough water to deal with its waste stream. Within the last year, fall of 2007, the city of Atlanta, home to a metropolitan area of four and a half million people, came within 90 days of having its water supply, Lake Lanier, dry up. <coughs> four and a half million people depend on that supply. Most of us, though, have no knowledge of this crisis, and that is because the water managers have done too good a job. We turn on the taps, we're spoiled. Out comes water, limitless quantities, clear water, for less money than we pay for our cell phones or our cable television. Water is a precious, exhaustible resource, but we treat it as though we're valueless and inexhaustible. So the situation in Georgia is quite stunning. They're in the midst of the worst drought in recorded history, and so they take dramatic action. Right? Wrong. They have, like, nibbling at the edges. Well, maybe you shouldn't fill your swimming pools anymore. Maybe you should water your lawns on every other day. Things like that. It, 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 it got so comical that um, the governor there, um, Sonny Perdue, decided that the solution was to hold a prayer vigil <laughs> so he assembled hundreds of ministers and believers on the, on the steps of the Capitol building to pray for rain. But, but the governor, not one to take chances, didn't schedule the prayer vigil until after weather forecasters predicted the first rain-bearing front months. <laughs> this is a state that is no better or worse than most of the rest of the states. Think of our water supply as a giant milkshake glass. And think of each well or each diversion from a river as a straw in the glass. What the rules and regulations, the laws in most American states permit is a limitless number of straws in the same glass. That's a recipe for disaster. That is a classic example of the tragedy of the commons. So in the midst of this drought in Atlanta, Georgia still is allowing new wells to be drilled. They're not even requiring a permit for a new well unless you pump more than 100,000 gallons per day. <laughs> per day. So that's 36 million gallons a year that this state permits in the midst of the worst drought in history. Ethanol has lots of problems with it, but no one really is looking at the water supply component to it. As recently as 2000, there were 54 ethanol plants in the United States. By the time those under construction are completed, there will be 200 ethanol plants. It takes four gallons of water to refine one gallon of ethanol. So a typical 50 million gallon plant requires 200 million gallons a year. You do the math for the rest of it. That's just to refine the ethanol. First, you have to grow the corn. 
Now that's not much of a problem in Wisconsin where you've got dry land farming. But most of the ethanol plants are not, thank you, in Wisconsin. They're in Nebraska and in Kansas and in Colorado and in California where farmers have to irrigate. And irrigating corn takes between 1,700 gallons and 2,500 gallons of water to grow enough corn to refine one gallon mm. of ethanol. The state of California proposes to produce a billion gallons of ethanol within 10 years. To do that would require diverting every drop of water that goes through the California, Sacramento, San Joaquin Bay Delta, water that currently supplies 24 million people and provides farmers with enough water to irrigate 7 million of the most productive acres in the United States. Every drop of that would have to go to grow corn. The ethanol story indicates two things. One, there's an incredible link between water and energy. It takes a lot of energy to produce water, to pump it, to divert it, to move it, to treat it, to cleanse it. But it also takes a lot of energy to produce, uh, a lot of water to produce energy, whether it's ethanol or nuclear or coal burning or other kinds of of uh, energy supplies, if they all take water. The second thing it illustrates is this. Water lubricates the American economy just as oil does. This is not just about those of us in the environmental community trying to protect our favorite money. This is about the society we live in and whether we have a healthy economy with good paying jobs. And a lot of the new demands, and I mean new demands for water, come from those high tech industries. So I would suggest to you that there's really no aspect of the American economy that doesn't demand water for its, uh, for its service. Okay, so what are the solutions to this crisis? Well, the business as usual solution would be divert more water from rivers, build more dams, or drill more wells but I don't have the time to go into the details. None of those are viable today. We have been building dams at the rate of one dam per day since the Declaration of Independence. Not a lot of new rivers you're gonna dam out there, so that's just not gonna happen. So what else can we do? Import water. Las Vegas. Now there's a rumor circulating around that Las Vegas would like to tap into all of the Great Lakes. I bring you good news. They would be happy with merely one. Yeah. <laughs> they want that, of course, to be superior. Towing icebergs from the Arctic, if there are any left. You heard Bill's talk this morning. Uh, diverting rivers from British Columbia. Seeding clouds. What do we need to do? And what we need to do is to move in a totally new direction in the United States. We need to rethink the value of water. The starting point must be that water is a public resource, and the government has a stewardship obligation to protect that public resource. The government has plainly failed that obligation by creating incentives across the country in practically every economic sector to squander that resource. We need to realize that the supply is finite. We're drinking the same water that the dinosaurs drank. There's no more water on Earth. Supply is finite. We're going to find new water for Google server farms, Intel's chips, and other new high value uses. How are we going to do this? And I think what we need to do is to use price incentives and market forces to encourage the reallocation of water. But let's start with price incentives. Uh, if, if you think about the price of water, first you're going to say, well, how can you charge for water? I mean, that's immoral. You know, water is as essential as the air that we breathe. It's one difference. Water is exhaustible. And to the extent that it's essential for human life, let's create a human right to water. Take it off the table. Basic human needs, if we can't provide our citizens that water in the, the, the country that's the richest country in the history of the earth, then we're a pretty sorry lot. So let's take that off the table. But in a way, that's a phony issue. Because when you do the math for basic human needs, it's about 15 gallons per person per day. Okay, times 300 million of us, what do you get? What you get is 1% of the water used in the United States every day. 
surprisingly small amount. What we have when we price water in the United States, in many places, is decreasing block rates. The more you use, the less it costs. What we need to do is to encourage water conservation by inverting, increasing block rates. The more you use, the more you pay, so that sprawling lawns, swimming pools, and other lush landscaping, discretionary uses will be done with the people who are putting the demand on the resource, paying the true cost of that resource. What about this reallocation side? Well, I say it's damn time in the United States that we made development pay its own way. I just, just want to conclude with a plea that this is really urgent.